Our speaker tonight is known throughout the United States as a preacher of the word. His broadcast ministry, Love Worth Finding, is featured weekly on radio and television across the United States. He is the author of several books and is a contributor to the Christian Life Bible. But his first responsibility is as pastor of the 16,000 member Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. In his spare time, uh, he is serving a second term as president of the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest evangelical denomination in the United States. We at NRB appreciate his articulate, uncompromising stand for biblical inerrancy. Let's welcome the speaker for the 49th Annual Anniversary Banquet, Dr. Adrian Rogers. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Let me make a few corrections. Number one, thank God I am not serving as president of the Southern Baptist Convention. I have served three terms. I've done my duty. I am finished. Number two, thank God the church now has not 16,000 members, but 22,000, and I praise the Lord for that. And part of that's because I'm no longer serving as president of the Southern Baptist Convention. <laughs> but thank you for those gracious words, and may I say also that I am uh, honored to be here and was quite excited about it until I turned to my lovely wife, Joyce, who's seated beside me, and I asked her, I said, Joyce, is it a greater thrill to sit here beside me tonight at the NRB or to sit beside Ollie North? And she said to me, answer not a fool according to his folly. <laughs> tonight is uh, Joyce's birthday. Would you like to give her a happy birthday? God bless you, Joyce. And uh, when I was invited to come and speak, she said, that's my birthday. I said, well, you're going to have quite a party. So, Joyce, we, we wish you happy birthday. I was thinking about a man who was on his deathbed, and uh, his wife's name was Martha, and she was there by his side, and he said to her as he was reminiscing, he said, you know, Martha, I'm here dying, but you're right here by my side. She said, that's right. He said, Martha, I was thinking about it. He said, you know... Martha, it seems like you've always been by my side. Remember when we were just kids and we bought that old farm, so poor. We tried to make a crop, and just when it looked like we were going to get the crop in the barn, the flood came and took it all away. But Martha, you were right there by my side, weren't you, Martha? She said, I sure was. Then he said, Martha, you remember? It said, we finally did uh, make a crop, and... We got it in the barn, and it looked like our times had changed for us. And then, just before we could sell the crop, lightning hit the barn. Remember that, Martha? She said, I do. But said, Martha, you were right there by my side, weren't you? She said, I was. Then he said, you know, Martha, finally we got a few nickels we could rub together and begin to save to put our daughter in college. And just before our daughter went to college, remember, Martha, how the thief came and Got that money? You remember that, Martha? She said, I do. But he said, Martha, you were right there by my side, weren't you? She said, I surely was. Now he said, Martha, I'm dying. And there you are, right by my side. He said, Martha, you know, I'm beginning to think you're bad luck. I want to tell you this girl that I've been married to. I met her in the fourth grade, the only girl I ever dated. We didn't get serious till the sixth grade. And uh, she's the love of my life, the mother of our children, the grandmother to our six grandchildren. And honey, I do love you, and happy birthday. God bless you very much. You've been wonderful love. Thank you. I'm glad you did that and not me. 
And uh, let, me, let me say, in all seriousness and all candor, I count it a privilege and an honor to share with you. And in a sense, I'm excited, but in a sense, I have a heavy heart. Never did a people have greater opportunity than we have. I remember hearing old Dr. Charlie Howard years ago preach down in Florida. And those were years not like these years, but they were ripe years. And old Dr. Charlie Howard said something that was like a barb in my soul. He said, I had rather be Peter, James, and John asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane than to be a Christian asleep in these pregnant times in which we live. And my dear friend, if that was true then, how much more is it true today? What a day, what an hour, what an opportunity to share the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. May I tell you the one thing that we need and desperately need more than anything else is a holy fear of God. We need the conscious presence of God in our lives, and we need to be on our face before God as never before. I want to share with you tonight from the Old Testament for just a moment, and I'm going to try not to be too sermonic, but I want to share with you as a fellow pilgrim and as a brother about the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I don't know whether you study much about the Ark of the Covenant, but every time I read about the Ark of the Covenant, I get excited because that Ark in the Old Testament was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, if you read the Bible and you don't find Jesus, just go back and reread it. He is the hero of the Bible. It is a hymn book. It is about him, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that Ark of the Covenant that went with those people through the wilderness, it was a picture of Jesus Christ. I call it the treasure chest of blessing. It was about the size of this podium, about two feet by two feet by four feet. It was covered with gold, which spoke of his deity. It was made of wood, which spoke of his humanity. And there on the top, you know, was that s solid slab of gold and those cherubim there with their wings outstretched. And there on the mercy seat, the blood was applied and there was the Shekinah glory of God. The presence of God dwelt there. They carried that ark with them. You remember the story. It led them out of barrenness. It uh, led them into blessedness. I, I love the story of how when the ark, the priest took the ark and went down into the Jordan River, and Jordan speaks of judgment and death. It rises up in Jordan and flows down to the dead river. The, the, the very name Jordan means descent, and Dan means judgment. And here's the river of death and judgment. And when that ark went into the river of death and judgment, the Bible says in Joshua chapter 3, that the river stopped flowing all the way back to the city of Adam. And uh, what, what that ark did was to stop the river of death and judgment and let the people of God go through. It's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ all the way back to Adam. Jesus did something for us when he died for us and baptized his soul in hell for us. And then the ark began to lead them into battle and it led them there as they marched around Jericho. And from victory unto victory, the ark led them. But then, after a while, they became uh, indolent, careless, casual, callous, and they went into battle without the ark of God. Now, I want to begin reading here for just a moment, and many of you know these Bible passages, so I'm just going to read a few and then comment on the other verses. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. I'm reading from 1 Samuel 4. And now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Now listen to this. Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. Now not as a first thought, but as a last resort, they said, Let's go 
fetch the ark. The holy ark of God, representing the very glory and presence of God. Let's go fetch it. When it comes, it will get us out of difficulty. They brought the ark of God into that battle. They'd already lost 4,000 men, and when the ark of God came in their midst, they lost 30,000 men in battle. Now just keep that in your heart and in your mind. And I want to give you tonight five propositions. And I pray God, the Holy Spirit of God, will etch them upon your soul and cause them to reverberate through your consciousness. And I want you to know that I am talking to me tonight as I talk to you. But I'm talking with all of the sincerity of my heart and I pray with all of the function, unction, and emotion of my being. The first principle that I would lay upon our heart as ministers and broadcasters and sharers of the gospel of Jesus Christ in these pregnant times in which we live is this. Put it down big, put it down plain, put it down straight. God will not be used. God will not be used. Here they said, hey, we're losing this battle. Let's go fetch the ark of God. It'll save us. I'm afraid that many of us in ministry have tried to use God. We're saying, Lord, we're in a mess. Lord, we want you to protect your glory. Lord, <laughs> give us the victory. Your glory is at stake. My dear friend, God did not give them the victory to protect his glory. God gave them ignominious defeat to protect his glory. God has glory, more glory in the defeat of a carnal people than he has in their victory. We say, why did, uh, why did God let the television scandals come to the surface? Why didn't God cover it up? Why didn't God protect his glory? Friend, God blew the lid off to protect his glory. Now, we need to understand this. We cannot use God. We cannot, as Americans, use God. Do you know what was happening last year? We were at war. But I'll tell you something else. Not only were we at war, we were at prayer. We were saying, oh, God, help us. And we went out to fetch the ark one more time. But after that war, do you know what Americans were saying? Boy, how about those Patriot missiles? How about old Schwarzkopf? <laughs> we, we whipped them, didn't we? Oh, God, help us. We whipped them, didn't we? I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, that one of these days we're going to go run, fetch the ark, and we're going to be in more trouble than we ever thought about being as America. Somehow we get the idea that, that, uh, that the presence of God is our national treasure and that we can take the Bible and wrap it in the American flag whenever we get in trouble and say, go get the ark of God. Fetch it. Fetch it. Fetch it. It'll save us. I wonder... How many more days of opportunity God is going to give the United States of America? I hear people say, well, God is our only hope. My dear friend, God is our biggest threat. I'm not nearly as afraid of what the communist or the humanist or any other eminist is going to do to us. I am afraid of the judgment of Almighty God. God will not be used. We have some young preachers here tonight. I call them embryonic theologues. And these, uh, these young preachers so many times, they're like all of us were when we're young. We, we say, oh, God, I want to be a great preacher. Holy Spirit of God, I want to be a, a great preacher. Help me. Holy Spirit says, I'm not interested. Well, Holy Spirit of God, I want to be a great Bible student. Help me. He says, I'm not interested. Well, Holy Spirit of God, I want to be a, a soul winner. I'm not interested. Well, I want to be build a great church. He says, I could care less. You know, we all want to be successful, don't we? Let's try one more time. Holy Spirit of God, whether by life or death, 
whether anybody ever hears my name or not, I want Jesus Christ glorified in my life. Holy Spirit says, is that what you want? That's what I want too. Let's get together. And by the way, I may make you a preacher. I may make you a Bible student. I may make you a soul winner. I may help you to build a great church. But you'll not use me. I'll use you. Friend, we can't use God. God, the thrice holy God of Israel, he will not be used. God called me to preach when I was a teenage boy. I hear about people talking about fighting the call to preach. I never fought the call to preach. <laughs> I am so thrilled that God called me to preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. I really mean it in my heart, not that there's any chance, but I'd have to step down to be the president of the United States of America. I mean that with all of my heart and soul. I'm like a preacher I heard out in Oklahoma the other day say, I'd rather be a Baptist preacher than have a paying job. Friend, I am, I am thrilled, I am delighted that God has called me to preach the glorious gospel. I was a teenager, raised in West Palm Beach, Florida. My daddy was not a preacher. I didn't have uncles and so forth that were preachers. I didn't know anything about it. Played football down there for Palm Beach High School. But I remember on a summer night, West Palm Beach, Florida, I got out on that football field by myself just to pray, to walk up and down under those starry skies in South Florida. And I prayed, oh God, I want you to use me. Lifted my hands to God and wept and said, God, I want you to use me just a teenage boy. Then I got down on my knees out on that football field, just all alone, just Jesus and myself, and I said, Lord, I want you to use me. And that didn't seem good enough, so I lay down on the grass and spread eagle, put my face down on the turf, and said, God, I want you to use me. And that didn't seem enough, and I took my finger and I made a hole in the dirt. I put my nose down in that hole until the dirt came up my nostrils. And I said, God, I'm as low as I know how to get. I want you to use me. And God moved into my heart and into my life. I didn't have a vision. I didn't speak in a strange language. But something happened in my heart. And I have to keep going back to that time when sometimes I get in trouble and I want to run and fetch the ark and say, now, God, I'm in a mess. Come and help me. I want to report for duty and say, Lord God, I want you to use me. You get yourself usable, he'll wear you out, mister. But you put it down, God will not be used. Now here's the second principle. Not only will God not be used, but God can't be captured. The Philistines, if you read this story, took the ark of God after that battle. And in the next chapter, the fifth chapter, it tells how the Philistines took the ark and they said, ha, ha, we have their God. And so they were thrilled, but only for a little while. Because when they got what they wanted, they didn't want what they got. They took that ark and put it in front of their silly fish god named Dagon. And when they came the next morning, they found Dagon flat on his face before the ark of the Lord. They lifted their fish god up again. Came back the next day, he's flat on his face, his head is gone, his arms and legs are gone. He is decapitated and all of his members cut off before God. Plague after plague after plague comes upon the Philistines. They have all kinds of sicknesses. There's a plague of rats. They're finally saying, we've got to get rid of this thing. They get a cart, a new cart, some cows to haul it out of town. It comes to a place called Beth Shemesh. There some men come, see the ark, begin to celebrate, go take the lid off, look in it. 50,000 of them are slain. What is God saying? Friend, God can't be captured. You know what happens so many times when we come to a convention like this? You know what we're doing? Or when we come to our Southern Baptist conventions or whatever your convention is, or we go to these preaching conferences, we're trying to capture somebody else's God. We're trying to see what they do, what he preaches, what he believes, what he does. We will get his God to be our God. 
Well, his God may be your God, but you can't capture him. You can't appropriate him, but you can't capture him. Do you know one thing that really bothers me? It's the advent of the cassette tape. Now, I thank God for cassette tapes, and our ministry puts out thousands of them as yours does. But there's a problem. They didn't have cassette tapes when I started preaching. I couldn't listen to other preachers preach. I, and I didn't have a big library. I had to beg and plead and scream and pray for the Word of God to get down in my heart. But do you know what happens today? A lot of preachers are spending a lot of time on the golf course and putting a cassette tape in the dashboard, making a few notes, and running into the pulpit on Sunday with something that has gone in their ear and out their mouth without ever reaching their heart. And America is sick of Millie Vanilli preachers. I get help from other preachers. And I hope you get help from my preaching. And I tell people if what I preach will fit in your gun, then shoot it, but you use your powder. And make certain that you know what you're talking about, that you have a living, vibrant, vital experience. If you don't, you're going to get far out on a limb and you're going to find yourself in definite difficulty. I read there in Acts 19 this afternoon in, in my room where those seven sons of Sceva, uh, exorcists, self-styled exorcists, they found a man demon-possessed. And they uh, took it upon themselves, the Bible said, to cast the devils out of that demon-possessed man. You know the story. And this is what they said. We command you, we adjure you in the name of Jesus. Now listen to this. Whom Paul preaches. In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And you know what that demon said to them, or those demons? Jesus, we know. And Paul, we know. But who are you? You remember that story? And they barely escaped with their lives. Jesus, we know. Paul, we know. But we don't know you and your secondhand religion. I'm telling you, friend, you'd better come. We're, we're in a battle. I mean a real battle. And it better not be in the name of Jesus whom Adrian preaches or whom somebody else preaches, but in the name of Jesus whom I know. God can't be captured. You use somebody else's God, you're going to be in trouble. Third principle I want to lay on your heart. Not only can God, will God not be used, and not only can God not be captured, but thirdly, God will not be managed. God will not be managed. Now, David is the king over Israel. And David knows that he must have the power of God in his life. And he knows that that ark represents the power of God. And David goes to bring the ark back to Jerusalem, and I salute him for that. I believe I had rather die than to be sentenced to preach without the conscience, conscious presence of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. And so David goes to fetch the ark from the house of a man named Abinadab. You remember the story there in 2 Samuel 6? The ark has been there for about 20 years. And David has quite a program to get the ark. I want you to see what David had. First of all, the Bible says in that chapter he had 30,000 men. Well, he has the right men. Secondly, he has a brand new cart to haul the ark on. Wonderful method. Thirdly, he has the best musicians in the kingdom. I mean all kinds of instrumentalists, except Greg Buchanan. They were missing him, but all the rest, the best were there. And then he had the right motive. He wanted the ark of God. Now, when you take the right men, what seems to be a good method, wonderful music, and a superb motive, you'd think you'd have it all made. But, of course, you remember the story. It ended up as in an, 
in a, a horrible failure. And uh, as a matter of fact, there was one man who uh, was killed as a, as a result of that. And I'm going to speak of him later on. His name was Uzzah. David started out to minister life and he ministered death. Now what was wrong? I'll tell you what was wrong. David is hauling the ark of God on a cart. You say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, if you read the book of Exodus, God has given explicit instructions as to how the ark is to be carried. There were rings on the side of the ark and staves to go through those rings and a certain course of priests who were to carry that ark on their shoulders. You remember that. But David now is hauling the ark on a cart, and it's when that, uh, the oxen stumbled and, uh, and uh, Uzzah put up his hand to steady the ark that the judgment of God came, Uzzah was slain. David is discouraged. The whole episode ends up tragically. Now, whatever gave David the idea to haul the ark of God on a cart? Well, if you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 6, it's very plain. That's the way the Philistines did it. Now, what David is doing is trying to do a good thing, but he's using Philistine philosophy. Philistine philosophy. He is trying to manage God. And God, my dear friend, will not be managed. You know what I have to watch in our ministry and in our church and in my life? That is that I do not try to incorporate some Philistine philosophy into our ministry. And I believe it's one of the biggest dangers that we face as broadcasters and as ministers. Philistine philosophy, and it's, it's everywhere. Sometimes I wonder if we've not learned some music from the Philistines. Sometimes I wonder if we've not gained a view of women from the Philistines. I wonder if sometimes we don't run our business with principles we've learned from the Philistines. Charles Stanley and I are good friends. I heard Charles say this on one occasion. He may be here tonight. He was preaching in one of our meetings. He told about how he came to the First Baptist Church of Atlanta. At that time, it was not the spirit-filled church that it is today. He came as a young preacher. There was turmoil in the church. And there came a crisis, a crisis in the church. And uh, there were some businessmen. Then it was a financial crisis. And they were, they were looking to see what they needed to do. And these were not bad men, as we say bad with a capital B. They were just men doing the best they knew how. But they were facing that crisis. And my buddy Charles Stanley said, well, gentlemen, let's get the Bible and see what God has to say. And one of those men in that church said, Now, Pastor, put the Bible away. God doesn't have anything to do with this. This is business. This is business. Now, folks, there are a lot of people in our churches who feel that way. I mean, somehow that our institutions sometimes are run by Robert's rules of order rather than by God's holy word. Sometimes we just simply try to manage God. I'm not against organization. Hey, friend, the Bible says let everything be done decently and in order. <laughs> you, I, it's ingenious what some people think of. I heard about a man one time trying to find his way to the county fair. He had a pig under one arm. He had a chicken under the other arm and a basket under his shoulder. And he asked a pretty girl, said, can you tell me how to get to the county fair? She said, well, you go down here a mile and turn left and go a mile. You'll get to the fair. But if you go through the woods, it'll be much shorter. He said, could I get lost in the woods? She said, you might. He said, would you show me the way? She said, oh, no. He said, well, why not? Well, uh, she said, you might get me out there in the middle of those woods and try to kiss me. Well, he said, now, don't be silly. He said, I've got a hog, a pig under this arm, and a, a chicken under this arm, and this basket. How could I possibly kiss you? Well, she said, uh, you could put the chicken on the ground and put the basket over the chicken, and I could hold that silly old pig. It's all right. There's nothing wrong with organization. 
Nothing wrong with thinking. That's all right. Let everything be done decently and in order. And when I say that God can't be managed, I want to tell you, dear friend, if you're saved, two and two is four, whether you're saved or lost. But what I am saying is this, that we had better watch, that we do not let the ways of this world influence what we do for God, even if it costs. There are people who do not have the heartbeat that we have. There are people who do not believe what we believe, who sometimes will come along our side to try to help us do something, and they haven't got the foggiest about what we're trying to do. And we, as men of God, had better beware and better learn that God will not be used. My dear friend, I want to tell you that God can't be captured, and God will not be managed. Now, let me give you the fourth principle. And here it is. God will not be trivialized. God will not be trivialized. The ark is going along on that cart. The oxen stumble. Uzzah puts out his hands to stay the ark. And God strikes him dead. Well, you say, Adrian, God was cruel. No, God said, don't touch any holy thing, lest you die. God had said that. That wasn't a threat. It was a warning. Don't touch any holy thing, lest you die. Do you know what is wrong in America? There is no fear of God. And you know who's leading the band that because there's no fear of God? The clergy. We're a bunch of backslapping, wisecracking, sanctified morons. Making light of holy things. I enjoy a joke as well as anybody. And I believe that humor is a holy gift of God. But I'm telling you, my dear friend, I am frightened at the cavalier attitude that some people have to the holy things of God. And we jest and joke about saying, I'll pray for you, brother. Would to God we would. Would to God we would. It's bad enough that we don't pray. But when it becomes a jest, you know, we're not to take God's name in vain. You know what that means? You don't have to be cursing to take God's name in vain. Just when you take that name with a lack of seriousness, with a lack of seriousness, we are talking about God. I'll tell you something I can't understand. For the life of me, I cannot understand how a so-called preacher can be living in sexual immorality and stand in a pulpit behind the sacred desk and hold this book in his hand. I cannot understand that. I mean, I just can't. I talked about Joyce. Joyce is over here, and every now and then, Joyce and I'll have a disagreement. Not an argument, but it's a disagreement and a strong one. Yeah, it's an argument. And uh, <laughs> we'll have one. And I'll say, no, Joyce, you're wrong. She says, no, Adrian, you're wrong. I say, no, Joyce, you're wrong. She says, Adrian, you're wrong, and I know you're wrong, but I can't prove you're wrong because you can talk better than I can. Well, to me, that's the ultimate argument. She's won then because I, I, I have to stop talking, and boy, that burns me. And so I'll go in my study, and I'll sit down. My study's at home. I'll say, well, I'll go in there and study the Bible. Are you kidding? Well, I'll go in there and prepare a sermon. Forget it. Well, I'll read a book of theology. I can't do it. So I say, well, I'll pray. God, did you hear what she said? He said, yes, I heard what she said, and Adrian, you're wrong. <laughs> no, no. No, God, she's wrong. No, Adrian, you're wrong. And you're full of rotten pride. And go tell her you're sorry and ask her to forgive you. And I do. And then there's the presence of God again in my heart and in my life. Friend, I can't even preach. I can't even study for a sermon if I've had an argument with my wife. How can a man of God stand in the pulpit and take this book and supposedly preach Jesus Christ? 
Do you know what we need, my dear friend, in America? Fear of God. And it needs to begin with us. These are serious days. These are desperate days. People talking about safe sex. Sex is a holy thing. When God says, flee fornication, thou shalt not commit adultery, he's not trying to keep us from sex. He's trying to keep sex for us because it's a precious and a holy gift of God. My dear friend, your sex is not safe till it passes the final judgment. And the gaze of a holy God who has said that marriage is honorable in the bed undefiled, but adulterers and whoremongers God will judge. If you get past that judgment, you can call it safe. This condemnation is headed for condemnation. Where is the fear of God? God will not be used. God can't be captured. God will not be managed. God will not be trivialized. Here's the fifth and final principle. My dear friend, God can't be contained. <laughs> David finally learns his lesson. He goes to get the ark of God. This time, no cart. This time, they're bearing the ark. David is sacrificing. David is so happy. He is so thrilled. He is leaping and dancing and praising God. Oh, he can't keep both feet on the ground because there's the conscious presence of God and his wife, Michael, a king's daughter and a king's wife, looks out the window and she sees him there in his linen ephod stripped of his royal regalia. Her pride is wounded. Her dignity is offended. And when David comes in with gold-plated sarcasm, she says, how glorious was the king of Israel today. You, you uncovered yourself as one of the lewd ones would do. Now, David was not obscene, not lewd in that way. He was just not wearing his royal garb. He was like a common peasant. And David said, it was before God that I was leaping and dancing. And he said, in effect, now, Michael, you may not understand it, but the common people understood it. And he said, if you don't like it, let me tell you this, it's going to get worse. I will be yet more vile Maybe in your sight, but not in their sight. Let me tell you something. Not only do we need a holy fear of God in America today, but we need a burning, blazing, emotional, passionate love for Jesus Christ. I mean, we need it with all of our heart. And we don't need to worry about what somebody else thinks about it. You want to make somebody mad, I'll tell you how to do it. Just get happy in Jesus. You know the old Grinch that Dr. Zeus wrote about? Every time he saw somebody happy, he bit himself. And there are people like that. I mean, they don't want our churches to be happy. They don't like applause. They don't like amens. They don't like fellowship. They don't like open fellowship. They don't like rhythmic music. They don't like that. They want dignity. And there's nothing wrong with dignity. But there's nothing wrong with joy either. Dr. Havner said some people don't know the difference between dignity and rigor mortis. <laughs> Listen, fo folks. The world is looking at us to see if what we believe is true. And David said, I don't care about what you think, Michael. Those handmaidens out there, those common people, they'll understand. Do you know what I believe about most books of theology? I believe that most books of theology are written from one theologian to another theologian. 
And down here are the people. They're playing keep away, trying to impress one another. And every church has its resident theologian. When you stand up and preach, you know, if it's not, you know, just deep enough for them, they kind of sniff at it. But sometimes if you'll stand up and go down deep and stay down long and come up dry, they'll meet you and they'll say, now that's good preaching. You fed me. And uh, same thing in music. I mean, uh, and I, I like good music, and we do great music in our church, but every church has its local connoisseur of music too, you know. And, and ministers of music sometimes are trying to impress one another. What did you do Sunday? Well, we did the seven last words. What did you Oh, we did a, a requiem in German. Our Latin. We, oh, well, that's, that's good music. And it may be. And I'm not opposed to that. But I'm telling you, dear friend, that the God that we know and serve, if he is who he is, there will be times when we won't be able to keep both feet on the ground, and we don't care what anybody thinks about it. Sometimes a wife will beg a husband to come to church, He's lost, an old reprobate. Finally, he promises because he's so tired of hearing her that he'll come. And he comes and sits down there and folds his arms and looks out under his brows. You've seen him. Suppose some little old preacher comes out, gives a book review, some soliloquy on something, and the choir sings something in Latin. Sounds like a couple of calves dying in a hailstorm. And the people are sitting there like cigar store Indians. That man can hardly wait to get out of there. But you let a choir come into that service and with a face like the noonday sun begin to praise the King of Heaven. Let the man of God stand behind the desk of God and open the book of God and preach the Christ of God and the power of God and let the people of God say amen. Those people will look around, and that man will look around at those people, and he'll say, those folks believe that stuff. Before long, he'll be believing it too. Friend, if it means anything, it means everything. And may I tell you that G. Campbell Morgan was right when he said that lukewarmness is the worst form of blasphemy. Because lukewarmness says, oh God, I believe in you, but you just don't excite me. God! can't be contained. Let's let God be God. One demon was heard saying to another demon, if those liberal theologians ever really let Jesus Christ out of that grave, hell help us, all heaven will break loose. <laughs> My dear friend, that's what this poor preacher's heart yearns for. Let's give him glory.